everybody and welcome to The Wench Bench, where friends sit and talk about fabulous fictional females and how their stories have influenced us throughout our lives. My name is Fonda. And my name is Allison. <gasps> Allison and I are recording in person again for Yay! a little bit. We weren't for <laughs> reasons. And also this is our first episode like officially back at it in a normal way. Yeah, we're got intense <laughs> yes yes it did and then my life right after got intense it was just a domino effect of <laughs> yeah life's been hard <laughs> 2022 is a weird year yeah and it's not even over nope. anyways seems, allison <laughs> is, I was gonna say, it seems like every year keeps getting worse and i'm just like can i stop living through history now please like i'm done <laughs> I'm tapped. <laughs> tapped out. Tapped out. But today, Allison is going to be talking about her final question. Mark? Yes. Her final True Blood episode. Yeah. So you guys don't have to listen to me talk about horny vampires anymore after this. Oh, boy. Until <laughs> next time. <laughs> Until something else with vampires that are equally as horny comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> Only time will tell. Exactly. So, today we're going to be doing an episode on the villains. Oh. <gasps> mm -hmm. Are they going to wreck me? Well, we already kind of touched on a lot of them, but we're going to get a little bit more into, like, why I like them and sort of their driving force of their, like, villainy. Okay. Okay. But I think a lot of the things that I like about the villains in True Blood is that they all like believed in what they were doing which i love like i love a villain that you can kind of be like i see where you're coming from like i get it <laughs> i may not agree but i get it so we're gonna start with the the first one who is marianne is her name marianne, marianne. oh my and she is played by michelle forbes she is a main ad a supernatural creature that drives humans to primal chaos, oh. making them feel intense emotions such as hunger, anger, lust, etc. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So she first arrives at the end of season one and is the main villain for season two. Uh, we talked about her more in the Terra episode because that was the season where Terra meets her love eggs and they kind of have a super toxic relationship that way. Eggs mm -hmm. dies at the end. Very sad. Uh, Marianne is the the catalyst of that whole thing. Marianne's the one who pushed them to those those excessive limits of toxicity and kind of made them be both lusty and violent towards each other and okay. like got super hedonistic about it. <laughs> Which cool. makes sense because Maenads worship Dionysus. The, oh, the Greek god of like everything that's about hedonism and drinking and celebration and sex and yep, party yep, and yep. yeah, so kind of makes sense that she drives people to experience those things and to like act out their innermost desires. <sighs> <laughs> Maenads in the show and in legend are extremely powerful supernatural creatures. In the show, she has tons of powers, such as increased strength and agility and minimal, like, shape-changing abilities. So she can, like, change to this sort of, like, creepy, long-limbed monster with these massive claws. Ew. Um, ew. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, she also has control over emotions and the elements as oh. well. Oh. Yeah. Her blood is black and tar-like, and this keeps her safe from vampires since it makes them violently ill. So, all in all, she's really, really hard to kill, which caused a huge problem for our heroes in the show. I say heroes lightly, because I yeah, mean... Yeah, I saw your air quotes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True Blood is not really a story of heroes. <laughs> In case you haven't figured that out. <laughs> it's more of a messy disaster <laughs> than anything else. The main characters are trying to get rid of this bad person. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the only way to kill a maenad is to lower their defenses, which they only do when they believe that the god that they worship, Dionysus, has come to, like, ravage them. So um, throughout the season... (laughs) And did they accomplish that at all? They do. Okay. They do. It's fascinating. Okay. They do a great job. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Throughout the season, Marianne is doing all the manipulating and taking over Sookie's house and, you know, sacrificing people so that she can put together a ritual to bring Dionysus to the mortal world. And she wants to use Sam Merlot as the main sacrifice. So Sam is um, is a shape changer that we had talked about, sort of love interest for Sookie, kind of supposed to be like the good guy. Yeah. <laughs> the good choice, but, you know, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Uh, it is revealed that they, that her and Sam have had kind of like a bit of a tangled past from way back in the day. And so she's kind of using that to manipulate him as well. And he's kind of just trying to distance himself from who he was before. By the end of the season, Bill, Sookie, and Sam are able to come up with a plan to trick her into believing her God has come to Earth. And her death would mean his rebirth. So she willingly gives up her powers and dies. So basically, like, oh. she thinks that she killed Sam. And so she, because she actually, like, stabs him. <laughs> but Bill comes along and gives him some of his blood so that he can, like, heal, you know, magic vampire healing skills. Okay. And then Sam turns into, like, a giant bull and is, like, kind of an image that would, like, represent Dionysus. Oh. And so she sees this giant bull coming out of the forest, and she's like, it worked, it did it. Now, to complete this, my god has to ravage me in order to, like, truly bring him to Earth. And so Sam fucking gores her with his, like, tusk. <laughs> and she's like, like, take me, like, I'm yours. Like, just super fanatical, like, fucking wild scene. <laughs> and she, like, willingly dies. And then at the end... As she's dying, she realizes that the whole thing was a trick and that this isn't actually her god. And her last words are, like, fucking epic. So she's dying, gored through the stomach, (laughs) and says, was there no god? So, like, she spent her entire life believing that as long as she did this ritual, her god would come back. And, like, the world would be remade, like, in their image. Like, they would live together in lust and passion and all of these, like, Mm -hmm, crazy mm -hmm, things. mm -hmm. And very culty. Like, it didn't... It's just, like, so sad, too. Because, like, you see, like, she really... For not being a good person, she really believed in this. And, like, Mm -hmm. the actress did an amazing job at just, like, that loss of faith. That, like... I did everything for you and you weren't here for me was just like heartbreaking, but also you wanted her to die. So it's very confusing and a lot of conflicting emotions, but it was, it was good. She just, faith is a complicated thing, but a very good tool for storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really like, kind of playing with like the dynamics like i was raised catholic Same. so the whole like concept of like faith and everything and gods and like putting your whole being into something like i find it fascinating mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and super interesting and so i really enjoyed her story because there's just something so great about a villain who wholeheartedly believes in what they're doing like she put her entire self into this belief that if she did this he would come back and it didn't work yeah i mean there's no question that marianne's morals are not great yeah (laughs) like yeah she she knew what she was doing was morally wrong but she didn't care because that's what she she thought she had to do yeah like anyone that again really believes that they're on the right side of yeah, you know the, the fence they want to be on bunch mm-hmm. of real th- things in history that have happened mm-hmm. for the general idea that like well this is what my god wants me to do and it's like not true so in this like little microcosm metaphor it's like yeah like she did all of this for a made-up guy in the sky who didn't for... come back <laughs> which good is, job <laughs> which is so interesting in a, in a series where other f- supernatural like fantasy based like 
mythological things are real mm-hmm. to have them tackle faith and then be like, is my God not real? And it's like, honestly, I couldn't tell you because in real life, I know vampires don't <laughs> exist. <laughs> if they do, they're doing a great job hiding it. But like, you know, like that yeah. must also be an equally challenging concept of like, it'd be different if it was like a human I think so. The fact that she was this mythical creature, yeah, like she literally has powers in magic that come yeah. from somewhere. That come, and that's why she believes in her god so much. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's super cool. And like, don't get me wrong, I'm not like harping on anybody who like believes in faith or like anything like that. Like, I have a certain level of faith myself, but it's just like, yeah, it's the fanaticism that's so fascinating and interesting to watch. And actually, every single one of the villains that we talk about today deals with some sort of like belief fanaticism which i think is really cool oh. um kind of a neat thread that links them all together i like seeing female villains where they get to be like she's she's fanatical and powerful and she's sexy but she's also like an older woman like she's probably in her like 40s to 50s in the show oh, okay. so but she's never portrayed as like less sexy because of it and she gets to like wield this awesome power and it was just like an excellent unapologetic villain who just was bad she was allowed to be sexy and alluring but just like super evil at the same time and it's such a hard like line to draw because a lot of times you do get your femme fatales where it's just like you know she's young and she's sexy but she's also evil but they did it in such a fun way that was just like, yeah, like, bitch is crazy. (laughs) (laughs) She is sacrificing people and literally cutting their hearts out. (laughs) Like she is Uh. fucking nuts. (laughs) Uh. Uh. (laughs) That's super cool. Love Marianne. Marianne's solid. (laughs) (laughs) I also do like the thread of like, as we've talked about, Greek mythology is kind of a big deal to Fonda and I. It's very fun. The, it's very fun. The fun, like, dark side of Greek mythology. Or, like, really, any like, mythology explored. is so intriguing. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Egypt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why I like American <laughs> Gods so much. <laughs> the book, not so much the show. The show's I, fine. I need to... I have the audio... I've purchased the audiobook, and I've just... It's going to be a while. Mm -hmm. It says it's like a 52 hour listen. And I think it's just because whoever I'm purchased it from has multiple voice actors. Oh, I was going to say, I feel like I've read that book in less than 52 hours. (laughs) So so I'm curious if it's just like more than just the book. I would have to remember because I remember buying it and being like, oh, cool. And then I looked at it. It's like 52 hours. I'm like, why? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it is like a hundred hours or something. So, like, I get it, but also it is a fucking brick. Ooh. Um, either way. <laughs> moving, moving on. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> the next person we're going to talk about is kind of, like, two people. Okay. Um, so, it's Why Marie. the kind of? Because one's a dead ghost of a witch that's possessed a body. <gasps> I see. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, continue. <laughs> so, we have Marnie, played by Fiona Shaw. And Antonia, played by Paula Turbay. So Marnie is the main antagonist of season four and is helped along the way by the spirit of Antonia. So season four is the one with all like the witches and the Wiccans. Mm. That's the one where um, Bill gets like his or not Bill. Um, That's the one where Eric gets his mind wiped and becomes like sweet, sweet Eric Ah. (laughs) that I love so much. (laughs) And they deal in, like, necromancy and, like, tons of cool Wiccan stuff. Um, This is also the season where we really get to see one of the ladies I talked about last time, Holly, shine. So she is one of the Wiccan characters. Super, super cool um, character. So Antonia lived during the 16th century and became a necromancer to help her village And during the Inquisition, she was taken captive by vampires within the Catholic Church. Because how else can you make the Catholic Church during the witch trials even more evil? Throw in. Vampires. Vampires. (laughs) Uh, They fed on and assaulted the women who were accused of witchcraft before they eventually burned them at the stake. Joyous. Yes. But as she and her fellow witches were burning... 
they collectively cast a spell bringing all the vampires within 20 miles out into the sun to die. She then became a restless spirit, her anger towards the vampires driving her mad. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Which was like, that event is what kind of kicks off the events in the next series because that's why vampires are so so aggressive when it comes to necromancy because like that almost like blew open their whole deal mm. when like a bunch of like well-known Catholic like leaders and stuff and then other people in the community literally walked out in the sun and burst into flame like that's pretty pretty wild and so that's why when in the present time in the show they start practicing necromancy all the vampires are like no because <laughs> <laughs> they know what could happen I mean, don't get me wrong. The vampires back in the 16th century super deserved to burn in the sunlight because they, did, they yeah. were terrible. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like the catalyst explanation story for why it is that the vampires are so like scared mm. of necromancy because they're dead, which I think is just a super cool idea. And I love it so much. <laughs> that's someone that's really strong with necromancy can control a vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. And so Marnie on the other hand, is an odd but seemingly kind woman who owns a shop, like a Wiccan shop, and leads a group of Wiccans. <laughs> Lafayette and his boyfriend, Jesus, come to see her and become entangled in her plans to begin dabbling in necromancy because Jesus himself holds a lot of power as well as Lafayette. Mm. And so now that they have like more powerful members, their circle is capable of doing more things. Along with Holly and Tara as well, they're able to resurrect a dead bird. But the following night, Eric shows up to warn them against meeting again. When he begins attacking, they fight back. They, and with the help of Antonia possessing Marnie, the coven is able to erase his memory, leaving Eric a blank slate of sorts, which we talked about, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Eventually, Antonia is able to fully use Marnie as a vessel, but there have been allusions to the fact that Marnie is not the good person she claims to be. One such warning actually comes from the spirit of Sookie's Gran. So, like, Sookie goes to visit, and then, like, Gran kind of comes and speaks through Marnie and is like, this is, like, you're in danger, basically. And it's like, oh, <laughs> that's the name. Okay. <laughs> Things aren't always what they seem. <laughs> Never, ever, ever. Marnie, with the help of Antonia, begins to cause chaos and disruption among the vampire community. She curses Pam and further enslaves Eric, as well as other vampires. Bill tries to apologize to the spirit of Antonia, because, like, they can handle Marnie. What yeah. they can't handle is this extremely powerful necromancer's spirit. Yeah. So he tries to apologize to Antonia for all the harm his kind have done to her and others like her which is kind of the beginning of Antonia's redemption arc and Marnie's, like, villain arc. <laughs> yeah. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Because we see, like, Antonia kind of, like, almost accepting his apology, but Marnie is like, no. Like, I, she has become addicted to Antonia's power, and so she needs that. And she starts going a little, a little crazy. Oh, no. With the power. Oh, no. Marnie actually ends up going so far as to forcibly bind Antonia to her. So now she has full control over Antonia's spirit. She uses this new strength to attempt to kill Bill and Eric. But Jesus, with the help of the other members of the coven, is able to release Antonia, breaking the binding spell and leaving Marnie helpless. Which is great. It's fucking epic. When they, <laughs> when they release her and like, because of course, like you do start seeing... Like, this is all going through very quickly, but you do start at seeing, like, how much of this, how much of the bad events are happening because Marnie, who felt powerless, finally had power. Mm -hmm. And because, like, Antonia's like, well, no, like, th these are different. Like, the vampires have grown, as it were, from the time when they were horrible to me. And so I want to forgive them. I want to move on. I yeah. don't want to be an angry spirit lost in the world anymore. Like, mm -hmm. but I don't, oh, but, uh, but Marnie won't let her. <laughs> <sighs> Marnie. After Marnie is left helpless, she is actually killed. Oh. Um, and in her desperation, her spirit possesses Lafayette. Oh. And forces him to kill Jesus, 
his boyfriend, which is a barrier gaze trope, which is awful, which is one of the things that they did Lafayette so dirty, and they just... In the same way that they did Tara so wrong, they did Lafayette also so wrong because, like, him and Jesus were freaking adorable. <sighs> but either way, he's, um, Lafayette kills Jesus and they take his brujo power so that Marnie can then use it because she needs more power. She's power hungry now. Ugh, I hate the power hungry trope. I know. <laughs> uh, but it's so good. <laughs> She then once again attempts to kill Bill and Eric, but Holly summons the spirits of the dead, including Antonia and Sookie's Gran, who are able to convince her to give up her revenge and find peace. At the end, like we see Mar like the spirits of Marnie and Gran and Antonia all kind of like walking back off and like Marnie's able to find her peace and Antonia is able to find her peace. Um, although I don't think that Marnie gets a redemption arc so much as she gets like a happy ending whereas Antonia I believe really did have like this for a disembodied spirit that is not like an actual person in the show she gets this really interesting story arc which I thought was fascinating to watch Mm. Um, so Marnie is one of those villains that I just love to hate the actress is super amazing but there was just like there's something about the like mousy powerless woman becoming power hungry trope that like I, I like it, but I hate it at the same time because it's like kind of feeds into that that thing that we've been taught where it's like ugliness, as it were, like speaks to evil, mm-hmm. which is like not true mm-hmm. at all. But it's like, well, no, like she was she wasn't hot. So, of course, when she got a taste of power, she got like evil, evil. And it's like, no, like <laughs> OK, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> like <laughs> that's not what happens. But I still, like, enjoyed the story. And just in general, we've talked about villains a couple times now. Liking villains is such a weird <laughs> thing. I know. <laughs> because like, in the real world, you don't. Well, yeah, because they're bad people. Yeah. But you're like, I know. I know that it's fake. And <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> because there's a dis a dis dis whatever the word is you are separated because it is fiction Mm -hmm. so there's like that safety net of like it's okay for me to yeah enjoy watching this and being intrigued with the villain because i know that they are not real (laughs) because i know that what they're doing isn't actually happening to real humans no one's actually getting harmed in the making of this movie (laughs) yes um so her arc from like unassumingly seemingly happy person to insane and desperate for power and revenge was really interesting because it's it's like opposing arcs to Antonia where she had the power mm-hmm. and she was able to like do all of these things, but her power was then taken from her and she was forced into anger. Whereas like, yeah, it's just this really interesting kind of mirror of their two stories that was explored I do think that having people like Lafayette and Jesus and Holly come into her shop and see these people who are so clearly naturally gifted with this power that she has been studying and learning about and has wanted is like, I could see how her character would consider that to be unfair. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I spent weeks studying for this test and this person came in hungover and did better than I did and like has never been to class. And it's like, yeah, like you, I can see that, that envy and that like, yeah. jealousy. Right. So even if I don't plan on going crazy and doing things like that, it's like, I understand that like desire to want something and to see it come so easily to others can be just yeah infuriating. And then to receive like a taste of actual power from Antonia, like, that was her chance. That was her chance to get the thing that she's always wanted. Um, very clearly, Marnie is not a good example of Wicca or mm. of a practicing witch. Many moments in the show go blatantly against the practices of Wicca, which is something to keep in mind if you do watch this show. I will have Fonda link a few articles in the show notes that you can read if you are interested that are actually written by 
people who practice Wicca and they kind of explain what it was that the show did wrong. I mean, very clearly they are not intending to depict a healthy practice of Wicca because she is a villain. Like they're like, no, like this is, it's clearly wrong. They're not trying to say like, this is what it is. Yeah. But for somebody who doesn't necessarily understand, there are certain nuances to a few of the things that they do in the show. Mm -hmm. Like for example, Marnie is trying to channel a spirit and she fully opens herself up, which is not good or appropriate practice. Like you're supposed to be focusing on like channeling a specific person. You're not just supposed to like open it up to anybody. Cause that's how you allow in negative spirits and like bad things and stuff mm-hmm. like that too. So that is something that's like a lot of people who are actually in that community at the time when the show was airing, were like, no, no, like this isn't, <laughs> this isn't us like please actually consult like a proper wiccan before you try and do anything like that same idea when um 50 shades of gray came out and a bunch of people in the bdsm community were just like no no (laughs) no we're not with them they're not with us (laughs) like this is a bad representation of my community (laughs) yeah yeah it's like please don't please don't judge us based on this like pop culture media media version of what it is um because I do find that like practice very fascinating. And so like I write into it a lot, but it just depends on who's watching and how much Mm -hmm. awareness they have because media awareness and like conscious consumption of media is something that I don't think is taught well enough. And I think it needs to be better. (laughs) Oh yes. Um. Oh yes. Um, So Marnie is clearly an example of what can happen when people want power, but don't understand or care about the responsibility of wielding it, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think that they were successful with. I think that they successfully portrayed a person who was irresponsible with their power and with their own feelings, but she was, she was clearly an excellent villain. She brought, a true sense of danger to the vampires, which we hadn't really seen before. Like, yes, Marianne couldn't be killed by them. And like one of the other villains was a super old vampire. So he was like super strong, but it's like, they always were able to fight them. Whereas like, it's like, no, like I can kill you. Like (laughs) I can bring you out into the sun. I can, she, she aged like half of Pam's face. So like half of Pam was like rotting away. And, like, they can affect them in a way that they've never really faced before. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, because most of the time, a lot of the... A lot of the danger to the vampires comes from them threatening, like, Sookie, right? Like, using their their connections against them rather than actually, like, threatening the character itself. So, like, having it be a... Again, like, that's the unfortunate part. Um, Marnie is also, like, an older woman... (laughs) Uh, so it kind of falls into like the kind of older woman is the villain sort of thing yeah, yeah. that we see a lot um and she is not allowed to be sexy mm. <laughs> unlike marianne who was hot <laughs> <laughs> but antonia on the other hand was a naturally gifted practitioner who was twisted and forced into hatred And when she was eventually faced with the reality of what she was willing to become, watching Marnie use her powers for all of this, like, negative and to harm people, which goes completely against Wiccan practice, she was like, oh, no, like, this is what I was becoming. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a major part, not just Bill's apology, not just, like, seeing that the vampires changed, but really seeing, like, I started this to help people in my village. And now I'm, my powers are being used to hurt and kill and like torture people and it's like that's not that's not what she wanted and so Mm. she felt better and she found her peace which was beautiful i think that antonia's story and redemption of and like healing was threaded through the season and it gave it like a depth and a humanity that i think is often missing in shows like true blood and i was glad to have that in this season and it was really nice Love a little nice nugget of goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just, uh, it's just fascinating because like I love witches and stuff like that. Like I love all of that. But this watching this really is what got me. Was one of the, like the main catalysts that got me into looking into actual like 
practices. And so for that, I'm thankful. But I was just like, as I was started to read more about it, like years ago, I was like, oh, wow, she's not a good witch. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Like, Which she's, one? She's a bad witch <laughs> in every sense of the word. <laughs> but yes. And last but certainly not least is Sarah Newland. Sarah oh, Newland. I love Sarah Newland. Sarah Newland. Uh-huh. Sarah, Sarah Newland. Mm-hmm. We've talked about her a couple of times um, because she like pops in and out. Mm-hmm. Um, she is played by Anna Camp, who many might recognize as Aubrey in Pitch Perfect. Oh, uh-huh. okay. Okay. <laughs> so like petite, blonde, big hair. <laughs> like, Wow. Wow. Classic Southern lady. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Sarah Newland is a recurring antagonist starting from season two, and then she comes back up in season six and seven. Okay. She carries herself as a good Christian woman, the epitome of a Southern belle. She wears very feminine and modest clothing, but behind her well crafted image, there is a clever, manipulative woman who will do anything to be powerful in her own way. Oh, no. Love it. So uh, good. Okay. <laughs> so good. Okay. <laughs> the way she achieves most of this is often through manipulating and using powerful men, <laughs> which is fun. <laughs> uh, first, she was married to Steve Newland and was his like partner as leaders in the fellowship of the sun church. So that's like the super like anti vampire church. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She believes wholeheartedly that vampires should be eradicated and that it's God's will that their race be wiped from the planet. She's also racist. (laughs) You 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 don't say (laughs) what really white church going lady in the South is just, Maybe a little bit racist. What? Um, they do such a good job at playing up like all of those stereotypes. That's just so good. She's just like, <laughs> well, it's God. Like, God told me to do it. <laughs> During season two, she actually has an affair with Jason, who at the time is having a bit of like a mental breakdown, and he's kind of getting into the whole anti-vampire thing um. Um, because he's dumb and is easily manipulated which is just like so her vibe (laughs) yeah and she basically believed like oh yes jason is going to be like the like the savior of the human race like he's gonna be so good at killing vampires and like all this stuff and he's gonna be just he's gonna be our little like warrior of the sun kind of jam oh no very not good when she eventually discovers that jason was related to sookie the town's like number one vampire girlfriend (laughs) she believes that jason is like like a spy like a double agent or whatever and that infuriates her so throughout the show those two have this very strange sexually charged dynamic kind of based in like hate sex and (laughs) self-loathing joy so yes yep Jason, for all of his flaws, is apparently great in bed. And so so Sarah keeps coming back. She's just like, I hate you and I hate myself. So let's fuck, I guess. Question mark? Question mark? Don't know how that's going to make you feel better, but that was her plan. Oh. Oh. (laughs) After the events of season two, her marriage begins to fall apart. And eventually ends in no small part due to the fact that Steve became a vampire and discovered he was in love with Jason, too. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I guess. I mean, whatever you wanted. Uh, Jason's hot. I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) It is funny, but also I'm just like... (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what to say <laughs> I'm just having a hard time processing So I'm just giving her the time <laughs> Like I didn't What you said isn't surprising mm-hmm. Given what we've talked about already for the show mm-hmm. But I'm still surprised yeah. That they did the unsurprising thing Yeah <laughs> okay. And like 100% 
like Steve Newland was completely queer coded from like the very beginning. <laughs> like it was not a question <laughs> that he had the hots for Jason. He just finally accepted it when he became a vampire. Did he become a vampire willingly? Um, I think it was like, I can't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure he became a vampire kind of like as a punishment. Oh. Um, I'm pretty sure that like the vampire authority or like somebody turned him into a vampire because they're like, oh, you hate vampires so much. <laughs> Fuck you. Oh, <laughs> oh, I don't like that. Yeah. Uh, that's not. No. No. He said that it like liberated him and he loved being a vampire. And either way. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Kind of like that trope of people being like super homophobic because they are actually like uh, gay kind of thing um so they kind of twisted that trope a little bit which is not great trope no. not a great trope no. so she ends up beginning a relationship with one of her associates governor truman burrell he is a major player in the vampire camps and testing that come into things in season six and she has been taking part in the study and capture of vampires. So, like, a lot of that vampire camp is, like, her brainchild because she's a fucking monster <laughs> um, and has been using her magical Christian lady vagina <laughs> to entice men <laughs> with lots of power. And so, like, she's just, like, banging this governor and she's just like, you know what would be great? If we started vampire concentration camps. <laughs> She's physically making me uncomfortable. Yeah. I am rocking back and forth. <laughs> I, she just has this, like, I don't know if it's a pitch or a tone <laughs> in her voice that no just, she like... pitch perfect. Ugh, you just... You're <laughs> like, bitch, I know you, and I know women like you, and I don't like women like you. <laughs> uh, okay. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, things get vastly more complicated when the governor's daughter is turned into a vampire by Eric as kind of a way to punish the governor, but also his daughter wanted it. So it's fine. Question mark. Not okay. great. Either way. A lot of the things in this show are questionable. <laughs> yeah. In general. Yeah, yeah. Figured, figured that out by part two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not by part one. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> not by like ten minutes into the episode. <laughs> I was, uh, I still had some hope. <laughs> no, nope. abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Uh... <laughs> so the governor is clearly upset, um, and he ends up spurning Sarah because Sarah's like, "Well, like we can have another daughter. Like I'll give you a new baby. We'll get married. Like everything will be okay." Basically, like. Trying to manipulate him into like forgetting his firstborn daughter, yeah, and being like, She's not important, it's fine, like, she's dead to you. Because <laughs> I mean, Sarah's just clearly capable of turning off her emotions and not giving a shit, yeah. And he ends up spurning her, which drives Sarah into the arms of an old lover, Jason. <laughs> oh, yes. back at it again with the yes, <laughs> white dumb boy <laughs> with the white himbo who's just hot, I guess. Uh, he gives in to her manipulation and the two end up having sex. But Jessica shows up upset after having killed the fairies that we had mentioned. Mm. And that pisses off Sarah because she's like in the other room and she can hear Jessica in there. And she knows Jessica's a vampire. So she calls the vampire task force to come and take Jessica to the camp. And then she leaves Jason. So it's Sarah's fault that Jessica went to the camp and Jason also kind of his fault. Mm. <laughs> So we end up seeing Sarah actually like in the camp and we see just how much like clout she has there because of all of the people in it. Her ex-husband is there. So she has imprisoned her ex-husband as and has ma- been manipulating and torturing him into giving her more insight and information on the vampires. So he's kind of like her little like her little prison rat um. who's like among the populace, but also telling all the like Mm -hmm. all the people about everything they talk about Mm -hmm. Um, she is also one of the main minds behind the tainting of the true blood supply with hep v and so that's not great so basically like continuing her path from season two where they were trying to eradicate all the vampires with 
well, it was kind of season two was like with violence, like let's just kill them. Whereas this way they're just like, no, like we can just poison them and everything will be fine. And it's like, oh no, <laughs> not good. Mm. So even mm. more evidence of her conniving nature comes to light when she discovers the governor is murdered um, by, I think it was Bill literally like ripped his head off. It was wild. <laughs> um, and instead of reporting, she devises a plan with a senator to pretend he's still alive while she continues to make decisions in his stead. And so she's like, well, it would be bad for publicity if we let it get out that he was murdered because like, he's supposed to be the most protected man like in this area. And then, Oh, a vampire got in and like brutally murdered everybody. But this was during like the billeth phase when bill had like shit tons of power. Okay. Yeah. So she's like, no, it's fine. We'll just pretend he's alive. And like, she really starts to get unhinged at this point. And it's, it's fun to watch. <laughs> you spiral. and I have different opinions. We on do fun. have different opinions on fun. Um, <laughs> um, she also is able to take further revenge on Jason, who was trying to rescue Jessica. Okay. Um, he got a job as one of the guards in the in the camp and then uh with this new power she was able to be like oh hey like what's up jason time to uh like you don't have any dirt on me and you don't have anybody to go to because he's like i'll go to the I'll, i'll go to the governor and kind of like tell on you essentially and so she's like well now there's nobody for you to go to so she cuts his wrists and just sideways not the not the just just enough to get the blood flowing and chucks him in the old lady's side of the vampire prison and it's like here you go so these starving vampire women are like hello jason how are you oh no (laughs) yes um he's eventually he's saved by like this like older lady vampire um who like claims him as hers which is a little weird their relationship is strange we're not going to talk about that though okay um when everything starts to go wrong and like Bill and Eric are breaking into the camp and they're breaking everybody out, Sarah ends up drinking the cure to hep B as we had mentioned in one of the other episodes. So she ends up drinking the cure to hep B essentially turning herself into the cure Mm -hmm. before escaping on the way. She kills a woman who was actually going to be a whistleblower on this whole thing. Who was like, no, like we are not down with poisoning all the vampires because yeah, (laughs) like, Oh my God, a person with, morals it's fine um so she kills her with her own stiletto heel and then praises jesus afterwards <laughs> i wish i had a camera no this is great <laughs> no yeah um, it's violent and <laughs> she's like praise jesus oh. like, girl you are unhinged oh no you are not doing well Oh, no. Yeah, your girl is nuts. What can I say? (laughs) Uh, Okay. Um, Before she's able to fully escape, Jason does end up catching up to her, but he cannot bring himself to kill her and instead lets her escape. Because deep down, he's a good guy, but he probably... Like, and well, in not killing her, was able to save, like, all the vampires at the end. Yeah, because she was the cure. Because she was the cure, Uh, which he didn't know at the time, but Jason's just a softy... (sighs) deep down inside in the final season she actually gets crazier surprisingly and more fanatical she's begun a relationship with a yoga guru and her ideals of life and purpose actually change she is kind of like in a different way trying to become a better person but is still not a good person okay it's weird um she's chased down by multiple powerful groups and is and is eventually caught by eric in what remains of the training institute that was connected to the fellowship of the sun. So she's just going crazy in this like empty institute, like seeing visions of her exes. Okay. So she's seeing like Steve Newland and she's seeing like Jason and she's seeing Senator. like the governor <laughs> and she's just like going absolutely bananas. Uh, possibly because of the fact that she took an experimental drug and now her entire like body makeup is changing. Maybe, (laughs) maybe she's just snapped, which is very possible because of all of the horrible things that she has done. 
Her story ends with her being held captive by Eric, who uses her to synthesize a new form of true blood to help treat Hep V. He also, for I assume the right price, is allowing vampires to feed on her directly for a complete cure. Mm. Um, the last we see of her, she is chained up in the basement of Fantasia alone. So that's her end. <laughs> um, I love Sarah. Why? But I hate her. No! <laughs> Don't start with I love Sarah. No! She's one of my favorite kinds of antagonists. Oh. She just like she grows and she changes and it's like it's always different and you never really know necessarily where her story's going. Okay. Um but ultimately there are those like weaknesses that are still there. Like she's still like consistently always down for Jason, <laughs> which is like the like the weirdest quirk and like her completely unfounded attachment to God and her belief that what she is doing is correct. It's just like how, I mean, I've never read the Bible front to back, but like I said, I was raised Catholic. That's not what Jesus teaches. Like the golden rule is treat others how you want to be treated, period. Like, Which I think a lot of, you know, religious fanatics forget that that's like top. That is yeah. number one rule. And just the fact that she's just like, no, like, this is all, this is what God wants. And you're just like, what the fuck? How? How is that what you believe? <laughs> and, but she has this, like, internalized misogyny, too, which is interesting to watch. Because no matter what, she's never really taken the, like, the front role in these plans. She's always manipulated men to do it for her. Whether she believes that that gets her further or whatever, mm -hmm. it's interesting to watch and to, like, figure out. Um, but, yeah, like, it's it's interesting to watch her manipulate those around her and to, like, be able to consistently do that. And the actress just has this... this way about her, this practiced perfection, this, like, perfect mask, but then to have that mask seem so solid, but then to be able to also portray, like, I don't know if it's in her eyes or the way she holds her body, or what it is, but, like, to show that, like, everything inside is, like, cracking and crumbling, and yet have this, like, perfect face on, and it's just, like, you know that there's just craziness behind that perfect look on her face, and it's just so good. It's so excellent. Love to watch it. <laughs> uh. And, like, her, her, like, toxic girl boss energy <laughs> is, like... <laughs> is so like <laughs> wild and weird to watch and like her eventual comeuppance is such a slow burn like for so long you're like okay like steve newland got his like come up it's like all of the villains relatively quickly get there like get their end and she was like fucking long haul like i said season two pretty much all the way to the end of season seven like such a slow burn for her to like be defeated officially and it just I like a slow burn sometimes, and it worked for her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, those are the final uh, female characters that I wanted to talk about. Those are the villains. I love them all in <laughs> the weird fucked up way that you do love villains. Um, because they piss you off and they frustrate you, and yet at the same time you like watching them do their thing, like Cersei and Game of Thrones, I would watch her do her thing all the time, but damn, was I happy when she died. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, such, such conflicted feelings. <laughs> How do you feel, Vonda? How did four episodes of True oh, Blood show that you will never watch? <laughs> even more so now, I will never watch it. <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> it was fine. It was fine. It was fine. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> little peak in Allison's psyche a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, it, uh, was a ride of confusion. <laughs> Fair. But it was, I mean, I think you explored what you wanted too well, and that was nice to see from someone, like, listening and hearing you talk about these fictional female characters and why this show is your guilty pleasure. <laughs> I don't know. Can't explain it. Maybe I watched it too young and it just imprinted on me. I don't oh, know. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I definitely was not, like, <laughs> bro, 
probably shouldn't have watched this when it was coming out, but I did. <laughs> well, I mean... And here we are. <laughs> no turning back the clock on that one. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> so, what are you excited about, Fonda? Well, <laughs> what am I excited about? So, I recently watched, uh, thanks to Allison letting me borrow uh, her uh, Disney Plus membership so I could... Uh, watch a movie with uh my friend and their daughter uh turning red i watched it yesterday it's so cute it's so amazing and i laugh at all the bad reviews it's gotten because they're just on another level <laughs> like part of me is like is this a joke in itself you know what i mean yeah. like are these... did you not understand what you were watching like the internet as i've said many times is a fucking cesspool and that it's a great movie it's great. It's great. I love it. I would like to have us talk about it because it was so fun. I think a lot of people would really enjoy it, especially people that um were born in like the late 90s, early 2000s, growing up with flip phones, Tamagotchis, oh. like boy bands, like American boy bands. Well, time wise, I would have been 10 in like the time. It, it was, was 2002, yeah. right? So it's like perfect. Yeah, it was nine. Yeah. I was nine because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, younger than Allison. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it was so good. I loved it so much. I really, really liked it. Just another, like, to me, it's the best movie of 2022. And I'm just, like, thinking about that. I'm like, it's on the, like, di like we're just going to be getting a lot of, like, like generational trauma videos. There's actually one of the, one of the TikTokers that I had mentioned in our Encanto episode did like a joke one where she's talking about how she's like how the like the latinx community that was targeted with encanto <laughs> is like welcoming in the like um like the asian community that was targeted by <laughs> freaking turning, turning red, red. <laughs> and they're just like oh it's your turn come on in <laughs> just, welcome welcome <laughs> but i really really liked it i liked what they did with the characters so much and i also just thought it was a bop the yeah. whole thing and the, the whole faces thing. like the animation <sighs> style oh <sighs> anyways so that's what i'm really into right the completely now completely different body types of yeah. all the four like girls <sighs> super Everybody. good we're gonna have to talk about Love it so much the anti anyways also the dad i just need to say the dad mad respect yeah for perfection me father yeah loved him so much father of the year award <laughs> for sure uh, but that's what I'm interested about. Uh, dear listeners, you can find us wherever podcasts can be found. Please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow us on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at WenchBenchPod. And if you want to reach out, you can send us an email at WenchBenchPod at gmail.com. All the art for the WenchBench was designed by the wonderful Tessa Joyce Regan. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram at Wherevile. Thank you for listening. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. This is my comfort show. Okay? Uh, I I don't know how. I how don't... is this your comfort show? I mean, I'm not gonna yuck your yum, I know. so to speak, right? <laughs> like to each their own. I just. It's surprising. I don't, I don't know. know. Of all the shows I would assume are your comfort show, Allison. Yeah. This is the one that came to my head. Yeah. No, I like it. It's great. Okay. 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 I have a problem, apparently. Hey, no, you don't. <laughs>